So today, speaking about objects in the collection, is Mark Sperry, who may or may not need a further introduction, but I'll just list some accomplishments for you. Um, Mark is a furniture maker and a sculptor and a renowned wood turner who incorporates lathe term forms, often using multiple axes in his work. Um, he's also a professor emeritus from Bucks County Community College um, and was the initial professor, the inaugural professor for the wood department. If I'm not wrong. <laughs> he ran the fine woodworking program at BCC um, for, from 1981 to, yeah, 36 years, from 1981 to 2017. Um, Mark's work is included in nearly 30 public collections um, in the United States, and um, including the Center for Art and Wood. And just in our collection alone, we hold 13 pieces of this work. So. Um, Following the talk, you're welcome to look around and try to find some of the, not Whoever all of them. Whoever finds the most of them. It's a surprise. It's well, a statement by Bolt. A couple of them are being displayed remotely right now, and, yeah. and at least one or two are traveling in the Explorations Exhibition, which is um, going to be presented at six different venues across the states, um, and then come back to us and be presented here in 2021, which is a ways off. Um, Mark has demonstrated and shown his work internationally uh, throughout North America and Europe, as well as in Australia, New Zealand, and um, on a Norwegian cruise, <laughs> most recently. Um, he's been recognized um, for his work uh, with awards, both for his artwork and for his work as an educator. Um, and he received his MFA at RISD, the Rebellion School of Design. So with that, I'm going to ask Mark to take it away. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for inviting me here, and thank you all for uh, coming. So uh, today I was going to talk about, uh, I'm supposed to talk about an object or two, but I'm really talking about two people. Is that all right? Does that fit? A little loud. A little loud in this, in this particular object. So, uh, yes. So uh, the two are David Pye, and that's P-Y-E. And uh, he's the author of this book. He actually was the author of a number of books. He died in, oh boy, when did he die? 1994, I think it was. And, um, I think you're wrong. But you'll find out. You don't know. <laughs> but um, he, uh, he taught at the Royal College of Art. And, um, you know, it's really unfortunate timing -wise because I think that he didn't get a lot of exposure to, particularly in the United States, just because the internet wasn't around, you know, he didn't travel here much, if at all. I'm not even sure if he came over. So this is right when turning started getting to be a big thing, the mid-80s uh, and on to, till now. Um, and the only things that, I, that one could have seen of his work was, uh, this is an article, this is an issue of Fine Woodwork from 1985, and it has some uh, a few pictures of some of his work, okay? So, um, but I think to most people he's known more for his writing than he is his work. And the fact that the Center for Art Wood has so many great examples uh, is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. Uh, I really found out most about it when Albert got these pieces for the, for the collection. And there's also a, uh, a book that's a little bit hard to find. This is a catalog of the retrospectives. Actually, that article in there is um, about the retrospective, the retrospective. But this is actually the, um, the book that uh, went along with that. It has a lot of examples of his work. So, um, so I'll start with him. I have to put my gloves on for this. And, uh, Thank you for that. Yes. Best yes. practices all the time. I hate that I have to put it on for one of these but, So anyway, this is a bulb that he did. And um, it's, uh, you know, as you can see, sort of two, two bulbs that are stuck together, although it's just one piece of wood. And, um, you know, it's interesting to me as a turner that even the ones that, that are here that are round are turned on the lathe. You know, these are all hand-shaped, right? So, and they're all fluted on the inside. And the flute pattern, see it, it's not perfect. You know, the spacing of them is not exact. And that's one of the things that I really like about it is that they're not perfect. 
So what he did to do this, um, there wasn't a machine that you could, that you could buy uh, to do this, but he had his um, little set up like a lazy Susan, and then he, he came up with this device, which was a, a gouge with a lever, so that he could just make it, come in and make a cut, and then take it back, rotate it a couple of degrees, make another cut, rotate it. This one's a little bit more complicated because these lines aren't straight in. It's actually they're curving down to the middle. And, um, and then the outside of it is hand-shaped with an ads chopping the outside uh, portion of it. So, and typical of his bowls on the back side, there's DW Pi is stamped into it. DW and PY, he gets his name. And then uh, there's a number that's stamped on there, too. This is number 8980. Oh, I'm sorry. It's upside down. Uh, 768. Um, the making of this object was tricky, especially because of this area here, this kind of girl thing going on in it, or feather crotch. Um, whenever I try to do something that involves carving, I avoid that like the plate because the wood changes direction and it just, the cutting, everything about it is going to be different. Even if you're just turning something around, uh, the tool's bouncing off of that and cutting everywhere else, you know, more reasonably. But um, I just love these pieces. I, I really like this. Uh, it's sort of like two bubbles that are coming together. And, you know, I just think it's a, a very cool piece. So what he made mostly were bowls and little boxes. Now the boxes are a little bit different. I just want to show you the pattern on the top of that. So this is sort of on a micro scale. Um, and he had a lot of different designs in it that he used. And he figured out to carve into it. And this is why it's this is why it's hard for this one. If I didn't have gloves on, this is very easy to open. But with gloves, it's a little bit trickier. So this is a screw top. Yeah, you put it in your mouth. That would work. So the way you open it is by holding it like this and then rotating it like that. So you're actually putting pressure so that you can then um, unscrew. It. Okay. So that's the, uh, the screw lid part. And um, his, uh, so this one is a screw top, and he also made uh, a lot of boxes that weren't screw tops, so they were just lift on and off. And I mean, I've seen a lot of boxes in my career as a woodworker, and there's nobody better than David Pye. You know, that every one is just perfect. The threaded ones, um, it sort of goes without saying, he always would make somewhat sloppy threads, so it'll never bind up if it would change its shape. Right, it'll always screw in, and at the very end, it just tightens up everywhere. This is a cylinder, um, and the bottoms were always flat, and they were always signed with a symbol for pi. So that's a symbol for pi. That's the way you sign it. It's the only mark it's on the left hand side. Oh. Yeah. Now, this is, uh, he was also a really good turner. I mean, a lot of times there would be a, a bead that was maybe a 32nd of an inch wide, perfectly half round, and then it's just seamless with a cylinder on both sides of it. Um, so this one, from that standpoint, is a little simpler. Um, I'm fairly certain he used a machine lathe to make this, to do the turning part of it, right? So the difference between hand turning wood is, you know, on a wood lathe you have uh, a tool rest and it's all, you know, your eye-hand coordination to make shapes and have patches or whatever. But with a machinist, you, you're not um, dependent on that. You need sharp tools and you have a, what's called a carriage that you can crank in and then roll this thing across just to make the cut so that it's nice and straight. But all the cleanup, all the tiny little detail you have to do by hand. And if you look at the inside, this cylinder is just perfectly straight down and it's perfectly flat across the bottom. So all indications to me are that's the way it was done. That's all sort of machine cut. And uh, the threads, I don't know about. I mean, they could have been hand chased uh, given the time that they were made. And for the top, he had a slightly different setup. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. This catalog is wonderful for this. This is a picture of David Pye and his little contraption of the machine for, for doing the carving. You can't really see much of that, but that's, that's him standing to do one of the bolts. Okay. He must have this catalog. 
<laughs> and then if you go to the next page, you have to sort of step by step. There's never a problem with people copying the work because this is such a labor-intensive practice to do it that, you know, you couldn't compete. I mean, he had a full-time job as a teacher, and he would make the balls. He just really liked making balls, but he knew that nobody was going to steal and find me out. So he made, so what's interesting to me about this is that um, he, and I'm talking about the making of these objects, it's not so much that, um, that, well, let me just approach it a different way. Um, he didn't look at the machines that are in the wood shop and decide, what can I do with the machines? He had a vision of what he wanted to do, and then it was, how, what can I do to make that happen? So he realized that he had to make the machine to do it, right? That he had to create it. And so this, although not a great shot either, this is a machine that was used, they used for doing the, uh, the little boxes. <coughs> and the boxes are kind of a, a yeah, there's one. Um, you can't really see much there, but the boxes are closer to being um, a bridge between what's called ornamental terrain and um, handcrafted item, okay? Now, could you do this bowl in a different way? Um, people do. I mean, forget that these are curved. Let's say that you just had a round bowl and you wanted to make tapering flutes come down. It's not really that difficult uh, today to do something like that with a router. You just make a router that will swing down, rotate this, swing down, turn it, and swing down. But the quality of the surface that you're going to get there is not going to be as good as this because this is cut with an edge tool just coming in like that with the grain. And the router is cutting it with the grain against the grain. Against the grain. And then it's, you know, we're talking about such a subtle level of ornamentation there that you would kill it if you took pieces of sandpaper to it. So these aren't sanded at all. Uh, these are, we put a light coat of uh, oil on it, but, you know, he's very specific about you know, how he thinks things should be uh, finished. This is another, uh, this, this has a little illustration of just the basic principle of what he had to do. is take the gouge, this is for the bowls, and have a pivot point up in the middle and a lever arm so we can just swing it down like that. Now, if I were doing a bowl and I wanted to do this ornamentation, I would likely turn it, not this particular one, but a round one, I would turn it and then part way and then come in and just finish it up with the final cutting. It just seems like a no-brainer to me as a woodworker. But he felt that the whole process had to be done with this machine. So, you know, the amount of time it took to go from this plane down into that surface was just, you know, how much can you take on a cut? And then crank the table up a little and do it all again, do it all again. So he did all the cuts with that same, that yeah. same mechanism right. as opposed to yeah. Roughing it Roughing out, it out a with a grinder or whatever. Yeah. Just felt that that process had to be carried you know, throughout. It. So. so that's the uh, first person, and I'll come back to him in a minute. The second person I want to talk about um, is uh, Stephen Hogman, who uh, lives up in Canada. He's in his uh, 70s now, I think. And um, he wrote a book back in 1980 this book called Wood Tur Turning the Purpose of the Object. You can find used copies of this. I think it's the best turning book on the market. It's not about technique, it's about ideas, right? So he had this residency in Australia, and this is a chronicling of the different objects that he made and different ways that he looked at things. And I remember when this book came out, how, how uh, you know, I, I got it, and I looked at it, I'm like, okay, I get it. I mean, I was sort of doing creative turning stuff then too in the 70s, and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I, I did that, I get it. You know, and some things I was doing were sort of parallel. I had made a mirror that had turned uh, split turnings that were used, split apart, and you know, made something that didn't look like this at all. But it was the same basic idea. And then what changed my, uh, what elevated his status in my mind was turning to the page that had this egg cup in it. This is an illustration. Of the book. And this just wowed me. It's like, oh my gosh. It's like I didn't need to know how it was done. It was just that this object um, stood out to me. These are sort of round, 
internal tubes that way and that way that um, just they hold the gag up at the top there. And there was just something that was just really impressive about this. Is my favorite turned object ever by anybody? Is this this piece? And um, so, concept, so to tell you how he did it, he took a square block of wood. He turned a cove on one side. Cove is like half round going in. And a couple little other doodads there. And then he flipped it over and he turned bead on the other side. Okay. Then he took the square block and cut it in half this way, cut it in half this way, and folded the thing up and glued it back together again. So that's, you know, you can see that there are round elements, rounded elements in here, but it was all very carefully um, planned out. And I just think that, you know, conceptually, it's just such a great idea. I asked him about this particular piece. I wrote an article on him um, for Woodworth Magazine, which I brought a copy. This is not in your collection, but I'm going to get that to the collection here. And I said, Stephen, I want to write an article about you. Can you send me a picture of everything you've ever made, um, everything you've ever written, and everything that's ever been written about you? And he said, yes. And then a week later, it all arrived. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, if somebody wants to research, you know, talk about putting something in your lab. I'm also doing a lot of research on work in Eshrick, and, you know, it's so much different dealing with somebody that's deceased, especially deceased that many years ago, to try to find out you know, some things about it. But anyway, I asked him about this piece and how it really stood out to me, and he said, this piece he designed on the plane on the way to the residency in Australia. This was the first thing that he thought to do. And, uh, so, uh, now Stephen's approach, he was quite the, uh, he wanted to turn giant things. That was his idea. Well, unfortunately, this is what I'm going to show you. But, you know, he, he wanted to turn things that were eight feet in diameter. Because right? the, the, the axis of the lathe was four feet, so he could the wood could go all the way to the floor, all the way to the ceiling, and spin around like this. He's like, how can I do that? Well, the way he did it was he designed actually with the help of his um, father-in-law. Um, they took the rear differential of the truck for the variable speed in the back here. You know, it's not a standard lathe by any stretch of the imagination. He had this frame all welded up. Here you see house jacks. So the house jack is usually, you know, it's to jack up the ceiling or, you know, you need to work on it or something. This jack goes from the lathe to the ceiling, and it's to clamp the lathe down to the floor so it doesn't jump all over the place. That was the idea. Of it. So that was his lathe, which, you know, so innovative and it's like, my goodness. But that's, that's how I did things, like uh, in, in the article that I wrote, one of the most impressive things that I have seen of his is this uh, chair here. And I was, at the time, doing experimental turn things on the lathe, turn elements on the lathe, like sometimes, I think the biggest thing I did was three feet in diameter, two inches thick. And to stand in front of that is akin to, you know, how close would you walk up to a, to a, a fan spinning and then put a tool up to it. You know, it's just it's a pretty scary thing to do. And that was maybe 20, I don't know, 15, 20 board feet of lumber. When he turned this chair, he actually turned two chairs at once and a table that went along with it. It was uh, 450 board feet of lumber. And I said, I don't understand how you did that. And he said, well, I, I glued up a, basically a tabletop that was set 18 diameter, two inches thick, stuck it on the lathe. <coughs> the the motor on the lathe was half horse, which for your woodworking people, that's nothing. I mean, now it's two or three horse or whatever. And he would take the wood, and he would hand spin it, and then turn it on so that it would get some momentum to get going. And then he'd go up to it with his scraping tool, which would basically stop it, and then stand back, and then it would have to wait for it to crank up again. <coughs> After he trued it up, he took another two-inch thick, eight-foot diameter piece, glued it to it, and did that. And then went through the whole thing before finishing out the shape of it. And um, anyway, pretty, pretty amazing thing. And um, he would not do any of that stuff again now in the 70s because it's really dangerous. You know, you can get killed in so many ways. 
Um, this this uh, its particular piece was one that he had in an exhibition in 1974 up in Toronto, and it made such an impression on the people that were um, uh, the, the world. What was it? The World Craft Council was meeting in Toronto, and the Australian contingent came in and saw his work, including this chair. And they they are they knew who they were going to give the residency to. And at that time, this was the only wood residency that I ever heard of before 1980. Do you know of any? I mean, I don't know of any of them that came up. And that's how he got the job. And then also fast forward a little bit forward. Uh, there was an exhibition called Wood Turning in North America since 1930. And uh, they called. So so this piece was pivotal in him getting that residency. Kind of launching his career, he got a nice spread in uh, American Craft magazine. And when Albert Lakoff called him, said, uh, "Stephen, remember those big chairs? Whatever happened to them?" And he said, "Well, they've been sitting in a sitting out in my garage on a concrete floor for the past 25 years. Why do you ask?" <laughs> and uh, said, "Well, we're having a show and so on, and I wanted to have a piece." And he said, "Oh, that's it. that'll be great." So we shipped one off to, um, the first stop was in Minneapolis for the exhibition, the Minneapolis uh, Museum of Art uh, bought it. You know, it's like, we want that for our collection. And then the, the exhibition went to Yale University, and uh, Patricia Kane was the curator there, uh, still with, I guess, and I was talking to her, I got, she's one of my favorite curators, museum curators, and we were walking by the chair, and I said, you know, the museum should really have this chair in their collection. Yes, but it's in the collection of Minneapolis Bar. And I said, oh, no, uh, he has another one. And her eyes like bugged out of her head. She said, really? But Stephen wasn't going to say anything. I talked to him. I said, why don't you t talk to Patricia? No, 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 people should come to me. Like, how do you know? So the next day it was sold. So, <laughs> so it went from sitting out in the garage in northern Canada. For 25 years, freezing and thawing, <laughs> taking up space, and then all of a sudden it's, it's the hottest thing around. So, um, Stephen uh, is someone whose work I, I really do admire conceptually, you know, from a conceptual standpoint. Um, this is a pair of uh, salad servers that he designed, sort of a production item. And uh, I asked him why. He did this just detail. I mean, I think it looks neat, but I, I asked him why he did that. Do you know why he did that? Why would you make that shit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you could put a rubber band around it. So you can keep the sets together when they're being sold. And uh, because, you know, they come from the same. These are actually from a branch that's that big. So we take, you know, so it's such a great idea, you know, somebody's tree comes down. All you need is a branch this big and you can make a set of salad surface. So he turns that and then cuts the pants off and the carves them. And I said, are these deep enough? And he said, it doesn't matter. They don't need to be gouged out at all. You can have two flat things for salad. And so I have a set and I use them every night. You know, there's something really nice about having, you know, a, uh, something like this. A, a wood object that you use all the time. I mean, furniture you use all the time. You know, this is a neat, um, neat thing. And I noticed that in, in the store, there's one pair for sale. So if someone finds it. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, these are, I don't know what these are made out of. And they're signed, too. But they're still made. So, why did I pick these two people? Um, one of the things that I found when I researched about uh, research Stephen Hogman was uh, he, he didn't really even want to tell me, but David Pye was his teacher. And I thought, what? And, and from my standpoint, if you look at the body of work of David Pye, if you look at the work of Stephen Hogman, it's, they're two different worlds. They have nothing to do with each other. Except for the fact that he, what to me he gleaned from what Pye was doing was don't let machinery or whatever it is be a limitation. Think about what it is that you want to make and then figure out how it could be done. Because that's what he was doing, and that's what he ended up doing. So 
<clears throat> I don't know what you call that inspiration. I'm not, you know, it's not copying by any stretch of the imagination, but it's more of that overriding, um, you know, uh, just the thought process in that, like, how do I approach this? And, you know, do I need to get a lazy, it's too horsepower? And it's just, but no, it's like, what do you want to do? And then figure out how you're going to get there. And similar to, um, by, he has written a lot of books. This one was the first one, The Return to the Purpose of the Object, which you can find on eight books. They have a couple of copies on there now. More recently, uh, this one, How Good on Return. I was trying to get him to get this republished again because of living every year. I think it's the best book out there. But this is a little bit more of a how to book of some of the processes that he, um, how he got to where he was going. I think I can take my walk. Unless I touch that one. And one of the one of the cool pieces, it's actually in the collection here, but uh, it's online or something like that. Is this uh, called and it's called walking ball. And he did, you know, it's another signature work of this is walking ball. So what that looks like is the many different big rooms coming off like that. So it's sort of like taking a a, a plank. Here, this, you know, say this wire, and you spin it like a propeller, and in the middle part you, you turn a bowl shape, and then it just goes out flat like that. And then after it's all turned and sanded, you cut it in half, and he's gluing together the, I'm sorry, he's gluing the, right here is where the, um, the seam is of the bowl, so he's folding it around to create that effect. Okay. And then if it's truly uh, a hemisphere, you can, they don't need to be the same. One can be flat when the other one's tilted up, or vice versa, you can rock it on either one. But, you know, having an elevated bowl like that, again, conceptually, it's, he's looking around, seeing what's being laid out there, and having his own take. Another big focus of um, Hogden's work is, is about the cross section. What does the piece look like? What does it look like if you were to draw it? Right? So, some people just take pieces of wood and put them on the lathe and turn them, and whatever it turns out, that's whatever, however it ends up, that's what it ends up. But he's thinking through uh, of what it is he wants to make, what that cross section looks like, because he's going to be exposing it afterwards, and you're going to be able to see it. So, from a uh, designer's, there's a few variations of that um, rocking wood. Walking wood. Um, from a designer's standpoint, you always draw the sections. You always draw, you know, what it is that you want to do, and then you can make templates and you get it to to be those forms. But um, but when but in his case, he always wants to be to be able to see that. And um, uh, most turnings that you see, you don't get it. like that. The pieces that are in uh, the cabinet right next to you, they're <coughs> um, radially symmetrical, right? A human is bilaterally symmetrical in essence. You can only cut a person this way, not this way. This way, matching. It's not exact, but it's you know fairly close. In the case of regular, regular turning, you have a round object and you can cut it anywhere, and it's symmetrical, right? And there's something very uh, pleasing about that. Something I hate to do, but I, I appreciate it, you know. But in his case, he's never looking for for that kind of effect. Oh, he's had, bilateral symmetry this way. So, um, I, I really thought about what I wanted to talk about before coming, and these are my two stars in my world, um, things that I really appreciate. Not that I ever do anything like that at all, I wouldn't even think about it, but I just really appreciate, you know, his dedication to process and, and you know, the, the surfaces that, that result from it. But when I walked up here, I saw that, and I saw this, and I thought, oh, geez, I could have gone in a lot of different directions. You know, this is one of the ITU students from this past um, this year, summer, this past, last summer. And, I mean, that thing is just amazing to me. You look at it, it looks kind of blurry from back there. Right? You should go up and look at it closer. So when I was talking to him about it, he's, he said these things are impossible to photograph because the camera can't focus because it's out of focus. You know, you can't, it's very hard to zoom in on it. <clears throat> but that's little thin strips of uh, butternut uh, veneer that he 
burns in sand. You take hot sand and dip uh, veneer into it, and it'll burn. You know, so you're just rocking it through and then taking it out. But and they're thin strips, so it has that kind of interesting look to it. This is uh, that's CNC done. The, the mold, the support shape, the support right? Shape, right. And it's hand veneered and hand. Yeah. So he had to do some very intricate yes. kind of calculations to right. make sure that the veneer, which was yes. all hand cut, would match yeah. up and conform right. to the CNC form. And I, I the tie. I always, I'm always reminded of the yeah. enterprise approach to tools right. and the kind of philosophy mm -hmm. and responsibility that makers have to tool using and, and the calculations of risk. Mm. Um, right. And right. and this is such a beautiful example of right. that. But so uh, if you didn't get that, Nava uh, was saying about how this was made. He has a program to figure out the form, right? That's all done with the uh, CNC. But he had to plot all that out, and then he wanted to plot out the pieces, those veneered pieces. So this veneered thing lying flat has gaps in it all over the place. They only meet up when they're put into position. He showed us at the open studio day, there was one sitting there and it's like it looked awful because it was just gaps all over the place. He said, yeah, it looks like that, but then when you put it in, it's perfect. Because it's all computer, you know, computerized. This this one's also CNC um, from Felicia Francine Dean. She teaches in um, North Carolina, I think. She was ITE. ITE, yeah, last year. And she had some really neat pieces there too. But now I'm talking about two minute pieces. <laughs> there's so much to see here, you know, there's one of the things that's really interesting to me about being here is that I, I was around it like 30, 40 years ago and, and you know, saw the shows and then you see those those pieces like special pieces from those exhibitions are actually you know, so it's just a very unusual um, history of wood turning in particular, but things pass that too. <clears throat> and um, it's wonderful to have it all here in one place and to be able to get close to things and look at them. The John Grass uh, business is down the street here. Used to be. Second, second street. One point six. Second, yeah. And, right one here. and there's some examples of pictures over in that far cabinet. But I noticed in this cabinet here, you can look it up. Do you see this mallet? That's a liquid lighting mallet. And that came out of grasses. They made those. I wonder if they made them for me, because that's where I got money back in the day. That's a nice heavy one. We have, one. we have one downstairs, and there's the educational area, and it's, it's like this tall. Mm. You can find everybody put their hands on that one. Move it around a little bit. So, does anybody have any questions? Uh, uh, more comment. Uh, yeah. The David I case. Mm. If it had been made by Stephen Hoffman, he would have cut. No, it would have been two pieces. It would have been two pieces glued together. Yeah. That was where he did all the stuff. Yeah. And I, I think that's yeah. a really interesting innovation, the cutting it. Right. And, and finding a way to, to change the form and shape by cutting it in half or in right. quarters. Or... Yeah, he had a uh, his rocking bowl. It, was very, 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 it doesn't just cut it in half, it kind of takes a wedge out of the two sorts. I have a wall in my collection and it's just a bowl shape. And it was cut into quarters, but instead of oh, yeah. gluing it back, like, he's rotated it just a little bit so that it's got the areas that stick up. It's interesting to me that he was, he, like his instructor, David Pai, they were both so such prolific writers mm. um, as well as makers. Yeah. And looked at uh, I looked at craft as uh, that looked at all the crafts of people and what they do and how they fit into the art world and the production and you know why all the separations and kind of looking at that big picture of, of it and they're all connected. It's not like they're, they're separate things. Just because it's mass production doesn't make it better or worse or anything. It's just a different part of the continuum. Any of those things can rise to the level of art. And, and then um, Stephen and his first book, he had sort of an analysis of how he viewed uh, the interesting chart showing 
relationship. Hmm. I'm not going to find it. Anyway, dividing up. How different people fit into the puzzle. Maybe it's a different, different one. But he has about four or five books out. This is by far my favorite. Anybody else? He might even sell one of the last ones for Yeah, probably uh, this one. Mm -hmm. no? You should be selling David. I think this one. someone to sit, it will be idiotic to proceed in the way in the way that students of design are sometimes advised to do and think that the whole problem from first principles, as though all the people who for the last four thousand years have been making and using chairs were halfwits. Where the problem is old, the old solutions will nearly always be best unless a new technique has been introduced. Because it's, because it is inconceivable that all our all the designers of 10 or 20 generations will have been fools. Uh, interesting thing. You know, just because you're a student and you're it's like, okay, I'm going to just clear the text. Come up with the design of this. And better. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Unless somebody else has a question. Joe, you had a question. No, I'm just uh, saying. Uh, you have a question? Anybody? No? You have a question? Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you.